I'm curious if you can opine on what the analytics are. And we have over, I think it's like 101 or 103 million views um, on YouTube now. Obviously, very war related stuff. I think we made from that a little over $3,000. From 100 million. It's short forms. So obviously, the longer something is, the more money you'll make. Um, but just, it's like, it's, it's bonkers. Like the amount of effort that not just me, like, five people are putting in in order to obviously our goal isn't to make money with that but it's like okay once we're doing it great let's make some money but like three thousand dollars is a lot of money but for the amount of views that's going in like youtube is making a lot more money this is my conversation with my good friend yakov linger Yaakov is the media mogul behind the channel Living L'Chaim. Who would have thought that talking about rabbis and Jewish traditions and interviewing rabbis about Jewish traditions would appeal to the whole world? But lo and behold, it does. At the time of our conversation, he had 500,000 subscribers. Now, as of the date of me releasing it, he has over a million subscribers. And in the outro, I'll explain how he launched himself for 500 to a million. But for now, enjoy this conversation. It's, it's really fun. Yax, thanks for making time. Sure. I'm really excited to do this. You, hold on, just to clarify, it's five hundred dollars. You're paying me your seven fifty. <laughs> your friends, I'll give you a good rate. Um, I think we'll just deduct it from all the legal fees that you have running with me. Yeah, don't do that. Don't do that. No, and then you're good. Now, now you're in. Now you're just in the six figures. Because that's your first question. <laughs> My first question is, what made you think about podcasting? Like, I feel like we were friends for a really long time, and then out of nowhere. You just started podcasting and then I was like, hey, that's a good idea. I should do that too. But you're going to get offended by how I start this. Okay. Because we have a good friend, Benji Weintraub. Yeah. And I went to him and my wife, Gita, with an idea. And I said, there needs to be a podcast. At the time, I didn't know it was called Shtel All. But that was the name that I think Benji came up with. We're just in the Jewish world. There needs to be more presence online. Like I listen to Guy Raz a lot. Uh, I listen to some of Joe Rogan and other famous podcasters. And there wasn't enough presence for Jewish people. So I really wanted to do something like that. Like find more about the personalities of from Jews. And there are magazines and places that do it. But I don't think in to as rich of a level as that. So we were going to call it Shell All. And of course, I was just too big. This is back in like 2018, I think. Made a WhatsApp group. That's the furthest I ever went with it. And then obviously from there, uh, Nahi Gordon reached out to me and said, hey, I want to do a, a podcast about Meaningful Minute with the Meaningful Minute personalities. And I said, okay, I hear. And kind of that's how we're meaningful people formulated. So that that was my start. Got it. So Stell all. Stell all. Yeah. It's, Why would I be? The a... name's up for grabs. We didn't trademark it. If you want to go, it would be Nachas if someone actually uses it. That's very interesting. And then you took it by like the reins. Okay. But before we go into that, you were doing like the newsletter and perm spiels. Like, did you, are you surprised with where, where things are right now? Or did you always think like, oh, I got to do something creative. I can't do like an office job. Yeah. I, I've been doing newsletters my whole life. I didn't even realize that. But I think the first one I did was not even a newsletter. I, I remember making comics, comic books, because I, I loved comic books in my father's office. Um, his secretary would help me with like the copy machine because I'd make copies. That's kind of where my print newslettery stuff started. And then from there in Camp Romu, I would make, there was a, a comic, um, a famous character from Romu, Shlopi Bokovacker. I had to make him up, but I turned him into a superhero and we did Roman news. Where it'd be like kibitzing with making fun of the canteen, making fun of like the new thing in camp. My friend and I, Rafi Stein, which I, I absolutely loved, and Rafi's brilliant. So it was, it was very fun to do that. And then from there, I did the newsletter in Yeshiva. And then with my digital marketing job, I did a lot of newsletters every week for supermarkets. So I've been in like the digital newsletter space for a while. Not saying the podcasts are newsletters, but it's it has some of the same spirit. Yeah, and I didn't mean to uh, say you don't have an office job now because I know that you do. You work for a law firm. We worked for, actually, I worked there too. Yeah, sure. We worked at the same firm, which, sure. was, which was really fun. Yeah, it was fun. Considering our history, 
you were also a creative guy. I didn't even write this down that we should talk about it, but like all the pranks that we've done on each other. Yeah, that is fun. Should we go through years? that? I mean, I think it would so. be a long podcast. Do you remember how it started? <laughs> I don't remember how it started. I remember how it started. And you can remember. Oh, yeah, I do. You, you are a very schlumpy person, and I need your fans, all seven of them, to hear that. <laughs> so many. Um, no, I'm kidding. It's like 14 at least. So basically, you don't have such good self care when it comes to clothing uh, and you this has nothing to do with the pranks you're just like no no, no. Of... <laughs> like going for like an hour just talking about like how bad of a person you are no so basically we were we first met in rabbi center's yeshiva first year in 2010 we were roommates with Dobie Friedman and Zvi Schwartz and you constantly just ran out of clothing and your sister would had an apartment in our days. So sometimes got your laundry done there, but you constantly would run out and you'd borrow my clothing. And I actually got a little nachas because I thought it looked good on you compared to your clothing, which is like always bad. And basically, and basically you borrowed my shirt and dry cleaned it. And it was very nice. And we had a window that led to back alley. And like every few months we would clean it up, but the back alley was, was nasty and we threw all garbage out there. Tar- terrible. And we shouldn't have done that, but that's what we did. And you jokingly like, oh, I'm going to throw the shirt out the window because we would throw things out the window. Again, no one would walk by. It was very private. No one saw that, but still bad to do. And you jokingly were going to throw my dry clean shirt that you just paid for to be clean out the window. And I said, Yitzi, I know it's a joke, but I also know that you would. And as I'm saying confidently that you I wouldn't actually think you would do it. You threw it out the window. And of course, you dry cleaned it again. So that's when it started. Okay, but you left out the motivation. I just sound like a psychotic person just throwing shirts out the window. You were on the phone with your brother at an outrageous time for a really long time. And I was like, I could get off the phone. I don't remember that part, but yeah. that part makes a lot of sense to me. I'm not denying that part. But then that night, I'm pretty sure you were like a little of a troublemaker and you went to town and you got back at like 4.30 in the morning and you're like, Yaku, where's my bed? I said, look outside. I didn't throw it out. We kindly placed that I got like help with like Sammy Gertner and... I don't remember who else helped. Shirley Lab, maybe Shirley Lab, and like we placed very nicely. Yes, Shmuley was there. We placed your your bed, your covers, everything right there. And you had to drag it back upstairs. Okay, so that isn't the full story of that either. I came back to my room, and then I called you, and you pretended like you had no idea what I was talking about. And not only that, you had trained everyone that helped you, who I suspected, because we lived in it was a small dorm room. There were four people that were living in the room. My corner of the room. Why do I think that you you woke me up though at like four thirty though? I don't remember. But then it I think that but then you, it led to like you were very lazy with the pranks. I, I remember one of them is Rev Nussin C. Finkel. It's actually his yard site today, so I mean you're putting this out in a few months. But um I made believe Sammy Gertner was his gaba, I think. And Sammy's gonna kill me for saying his name, so sorry, Sammy. Maybe bleep it out, we'll ask him first. Um Sammy was his unofficial gaba. And I printed that, I think it was like Charles Turwitt shirts for like some crazy price, like three for $30 or something like that. And I placed it all around the mirror and with your phone number. And you just got hundreds of calls. My phone at the time, it was like some like Hebrew, like Israeli phone situation. It wasn't like an iPhone or anything. It was, you know, it was some schlocky phone. It literally it couldn't function. It got overloaded. Like it had the max amount of yeah. voicemails that it could possibly but display. Then, but hold on, but what what happened? Like your brother in law called, like like to to call. No, oh, but- Sammy called, making believe he's the guy of Nussin C. Finkel, asking for shirts. There were there were, and your brother in law picked this like, hey, this is ridiculous at this point. And uh, yeah, that was really creative of you. You put like flyers everywhere in Yushalayim, like in the coffee nook in the mirror and on buses, like really cheap Charles Turwood shirts. And you're reminding me also another one is that you're from L.A., so you don't really wear coats. So you brought a coat to Israel because you're so excited. And you love the coat. It happened to be a cool coat and you accidentally left it. I think this is like later on. You weren't in Israel your second year, but or my second year. And you left the coat, which I returned to you. And in the pocket was like 100 pictures. I went to every single random person in Israel I could find, along with our friends, and they wore your coat, which is something that you, I mean, there's a lot of people that were not clean to to make it. There's a guy named Ishpish. It's not nice to call him that. It's not nice to call him that, but 
I recognized him. Yeah. I think you also sent it to me in a Dropbox link so that we could have it digitized so that yeah. I'd never forget. It's there that. was a bus, like a tour bus of, of, um, of Asian folks that you had. Yeah. They were all cracking up. It was really it. anyone, anyone who was willing to put it on, which surprisingly was a lot more people than I anticipated. So I, I didn't even know that. I had worn the coat for a day or two before understanding this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was irreparable like a traumatic pocket. damage, yeah. And your, but your pranks, your pranks were always like very lazy. So one of them though was really good. Which one? The, oh, yeah. The FBI one? The FBI one was- That was very good. You could say it over. I think you should. I mean, I, I, I have such nachos for myself though from for doing it. I was in a prank war with you for like two years, which thank God it's over, or is it? No, okay. <laughs> I hope it's over. Um, and- I keep thinking about it now, like getting back. But I don't it. remember why. I don't. Rem I don't remember the details. I remember all I remember is getting an email from the FBI. It literally said like Frank at FBI dot com or something like that. Where it's like, whoa, this is serious. Dot gov. Dot gov. And I remember getting it. I remember going to my Rebbe, Rebbe Victor, and he's like, and like I'm like, this is super serious. Like I left the country. I wasn't supposed to leave the country. And he's like, he's like, oh, yeah, this does. And he's like, wait, aren't you the prank where he hits Ingram? I'm like, I am. But this is real because look at the email address. You can't just make that up. Turns out you could just make it up, but I didn't know. But I don't remember what it was like because I, it said don't leave the country. Yeah, it was like a week long, but I had the advantage of being your friend at the time also. So I had inside information as to your whereabouts. Right. So I was using that. I got my Yako Freeman's father, Chaim Freeman, who without knowing very much about our prank war or why he was doing this, was so happy to jump in and, yeah. and he has a very gruff voice and I spoofed like Langley, Virginia's phone number and then he left you a voicemail like, right. hey, this is Frank, uh, don't leave. I'm not doing a good imitation of him, but he has like a completely, un you know, in his I wish I had that voicemail song and just play it over. Oh my God. So right, he called me and then I got an email. So the call was like, okay, but then the email really, the .gov part was like. The .gov part, but you also remember said that I had misspelled something in the email and that made you believe it more because you're like, oh, this is a real guy. Oh, it wasn't like a like, robot. Right, there was like one misspelling. You're right. like, this is a real person. And the email, essentially, I was just, I was just telling you don't, don't go to Israel because I knew you were going back to Yeshiva. I was like, don't, we need you for a mission. And then when you landed, I emailed you again. It was like, I know you left. Like now our pickup team has to come get you. Right. And I think like Maishi Gold or someone else told me that in Yeshiva, you were walking around like you thought you were James Maishi Bond. Gold, yeah. Oh, from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, go on. Yeah, Blitz. Yeah, I vaguely remember him. Yeah, okay. Right. On. And he, so he was telling me that... Um, that you were walking around thinking like, oh my gosh, I'm the Jewish James Bond. And then like, I, yeah, you eventually wore me down and I broke, but that, that was a good prank that oh, I yeah. had. Yeah. I feel, by the way, could I just like speak out about your podcast, get a little meta? I, I don't know if there's anyone that gives you more havoc for the style of your show. Cause your show started off as this is out of the courtroom for lawyers. And then you just started interviewing a lot of people, which, by the way, I'm not necessarily proud of being on this roster because it is very random and like, honestly, a little inappropriate. And then this kind of just turned into the show where you're like, just who do you think you're Joe Rogan? And you're just like, interviewing. Rand like, I don't belong on the real show over here. Like, I think you should go back to out of the courtroom. And I think your listeners want that. I mean, this might be interesting for someone who knows you or me personally, but like, I don't know what this has to do with any of your listeners. Well, we could talk about your legal troubles and then we can make it more legal slanted. I actually <laughs> made a shidduch of someone that worked for your brother's company in marketing and she had a great idea, Bracha 10. She was like, you can interview whoever you want as long as you come up with some formula that creates a legal, like fluff it up, make it legal. The last based. episode that you did. Not the last one, but like the last three, like they weren't all legal. I interviewed LSAT by Fish. That's pretty law related. I interviewed Turks. Don't give me examples of ones that you did, but there are ones that you did that were like weren't really legal related, but you thought it's like, oh, this is interesting. Right. I interviewed an exotic dancer. Like that is nothing yeah. to do with anything. Yeah. I saw it. I'm like, what are you doing? Like you're just like taking your brand and you're like crumpling. Like it has nothing to do with your brand. Like it might be a stimulating conversation for you personally, but like your core audience of like friends of ours that are it happens to be that I know them that they're like from people that are are lawyers who really like the show. They're like, what's going on here? Like, this isn't why I signed up. I guess that's why it's really I have envy for for you and what you're able to do because you have such discipline. Like, I know you. You have such diverse interests. You're very talented. You have so much uh, sense of humor and knowledge of what's out there. Also, 
And yet you like really like stay in a very defined box and you do not deviate. Like I've pitched over the years, I've pitched like a, a few guests that are that like good from interesting people or that would seemingly fit with your brand. And you're like, no, it's a little right. bit too much of this or too much of that. And it's, it's fast. I don't know how interesting this is to people listening who like don't produce stuff. But yeah, I, I think at least with Living With High Am, if like Brad Pitt, like I don't know, like think of like one really famous celebrity said like, oh, I'd love to come on Inspiration for the Nation. Unless there's like a good pitch. But let's say just randomly Brad Pitt for as much as I know about him now. I'm like, he's a good actor. I don't think he's an inspiration for the nation. And like if I put it on, my core audience of people like tune in every single week, they'd be like, what are you doing? And everything that I do, like they're my unofficial boss when it comes to living the time. Any show, kosher money, that's an issue. Like anything that we're doing, the core audience should and they are unofficially dictating what kind of guests they want to hear. And sometimes things shift. Sometimes it shifts a little, and that's fine. I'll say, like, right now, again, it's going to be old news, but, like, we're uh, hopefully we're going on with this war with Gaza, with Israel and Gaza. It shifted a lot. Like, my, my mission has shifted, but it's still in the realms of what living with Chaim is. And I think you totally started with a good path and totally just threw that in the garbage. So, so there's, there's more bashing. Like, like me, having me is like such a, and you're past the point of like being able to rectify it is why I said I'll do it. Because I'm like, I, it's it's so random as it is. I'm like, okay. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's so much fun to just come here. To just come in and slam me. I, yeah. I guess. Let's talk about that hat. <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, to your credit, you, you're, you said, oh, I'll, I'll wear a yarmulke for this. And I, I don't have a yarmulke in the office because why would I have a random yarmulke lying around? So I'm only allowing you to wear that hat, which I hate with a passion because I don't have a yarmulke. I'll tell you something very funny that you don't know that, that you'll enjoy. The, the guy that I interviewed on my podcast, he was homeless for like 30 years. He got housing now after COVID, but he, and he ran into some legal trouble. So that's why you had him on. Yeah, go on. No, totally not. Just the homelessness crisis crisis in LA is something very serious. And he has a very nuanced and interesting perspective about it. Anyhow, he edits my podcast now. He, that's cool. Yeah, he edits like the past like couple dozen episodes at least, and he's like, some of your episodes, I guess, because this is a, a slamming me yeah. uh, session. But he's like, some of your episodes, you're so annoying to the guests. Wow, that's serious. <laughs> like I'm making from your hat and like, like the brand. He's like, you should wear a yarmulke just so people understand that when you're ignorant, it's like, oh, he comes from like a very sheltered, like naive background. Well, that is pretty anti-Semitic. No? Is he Jewish? He's totally not anti-Semitic. He's actually written many books about like praising the Orthodox, not praising, but like engagement with the Orthodox community. He meant it in like a, a defensive way. Like he meant it like from I, a specific, sheltered background. No, so I'll give you a specific example so you understand. And this is good. This is why nuance is important. Like um, I interviewed this woman about like the woman life freedom movement in Iran, which now with, like the Gaza thing in Ukraine and like so many other world crises that like it feels like 20 years ago that that was even a thing where they were jailing women for wearing a, a hijab or whatever. And I interviewed her and I, I I was still even though I have like Iranian friends that are not Jewish that that immigrated here, came to law school or whatever, I, I still had this like notion in my head that it's just like this backwards country of people just like being terrorists all over the place. And he, she's like, no, it's a really beautiful country. And like, there's a lot of cities that are extremely developed and very wealthy and very educated people. And like, it, it just, my volley with her back and forth of like me deshelling myself from that. He's like, you need to wear a yarmulke to explain why you don't know this. Like as a lawyer, as a citizen of the world. I love how like it's coming to you from like a homeless guy who's not <laughs> Jewish, who's saying like, maybe you should like show more of your Jewish identity. <laughs> like that's that's how Shem's message. Like <laughs> totally, that's where it's coming from. Totally. And that guy, just one more lesson from that guy that I thought was really beautiful about that too. I was expressing some anxiety and confusion that I was feeling in the world, an existential crisis and whatever. And he's like, you need to have instruments like in the 80s, these pilots, I think I told this to you already maybe, but these pilots would, would um, there was a phenomenon that they would crash into the sea because they couldn't distinguish between the ocean and the sky. And the ones that were able to rely on their instruments and hold strong and be like, no, these analog instruments are going to tell me where I need to go and what I need to do. Those were the ones that always were survived, you know, survived and were reliable pilots. And he's like, the instruments are keeping your word. Like you need to have certain principles. Those are your instruments. Like so you need a, I don't know, a Torah or something <laughs> to keep you guided to navigate the world. Yeah, totally. It's funny how where the Musar comes. Yeah, it's I think funny. I think it has a lot to do with like ego. And that could be things. cool. Like a good podcast of like just unaffiliated, totally someone who's not Jewish giving Musar. 
but like from like a, a deep place. I don't know. Okay. I wish you could have him on. He's he's a great guy. He doesn't bet, even though he's good muster. It seems like. No, it would I think it might maybe like it sounds like you came up with it yourself just now. Right. I, that wasn't. Even no, me, I, but... I went for like a whole different show, like not just an an episode, but whatever. Okay, but back to your question. You have so many different shows. That's also really cool. You so you create like these things, stay in the box, stay in your lane. You know what it is. You also know how to like trip up the algorithm in the words of Oliver Gertner, which I think is a very funny way to describe it. And like you've kind of said this too to me jokingly, where it's like. There's like a rabbi with like a big fluffy beard and he's in the thumbnail, which you're so good at, is like, learn about Jews and money. And then uh, he's like, how to make money. And like people from all over the world are like, all right, that sounds like. Well, t- yeah, in, in my defense, I did not realize how interested the non-Jewish world would be with our content. I, I literally made it for Orthodox Jews. I think there was a lacking in content from us. Like I think Jews are great at business. Jews are good at Torah study and chesed, like a lot of things we're good at when it comes to at least the film world, like media, we're terrible. And I think that's why, like, we just have terrible PR just that as a whole. And I just want to create content that helps like that. If I was an eight year old kid and I'm like, oh, I would love to tune in to Inspiration for the Nation or I'm 18 years old and like dealing with finances like, oh, kosher money, that would be a good guide for me. Like coming from Jews who who experienced that, did not realize that. And I should have probably realized that like, non-Jews would be like, wow, money, Jews, like it is a stereotype. And I think Jews are not everyone and we have a high cost, but relatively good with money. And I did not realize how much they'd buy into it, pun intended. And and as we go on, I'm seeing like what works, what doesn't work. Like I'm not not really trying to expose, like just, I mean, the, I think the person you're describing, like Ramanus Friedman, like I know how he looks, fine putting, I'm using him in the thumbnail, we're using each person. And the, trying to get the core of like the conversation, what he's talking about, like I don't remember what it was, Kabbalah and money, whatever it is. Like, okay, wh- how do we encapsulate encapsulate that into a thumbnail and put it out there that people are? Can enjoy? you see of your four hundred and fifty thousand subscribers, like how many people are? As of now, it's four seventeen. By but, the time this airs, it'll be like yeah. six hundred at the uh, rate you're going. But six hundred, then you'll be like a nation, right? That's, yeah. Oh, cool. What what? What, yeah, what percentage of people are, are Jewish even? Can you see that? Or yeah, you can't it's a tell? great question. I, I, I can't tell. I know from our podcasts, our audio, which is not even the numbers you included, is I would imagine 99% Jewish, um, Orthodox even. But when it comes to YouTube, it is marketing it to people that would find it interesting. So it's definitely people that are have an interest in Jews. I I, I don't know. I. I just know the more people that see my stuff, the more Orthodox Jews will see my stuff. So I'm happy to make a Kiddush Hashem. And that's been one of our, that's been our second core mission. But our first mission is to provide content for Orthodox Jews. And secondly, we want to do that in a way that will make a Kiddush Hashem. So I don't know the answer. I just know to keep on doing what we're doing. Hopefully it's making a good impact. I would actually say that from the Israel-Gaza war, you, I think, I could be wrong. I don't don't really know. We don't talk about this at all. But I feel like there's been a bit of a pivot in um, the focus is a little bit more inspirational. It's more about like being positive and being that light, which is so good. I I, I don't think you were as focused on that. Yeah, we definitely shifted with the war because I I remember the first night, whatever it was, Monday night or to, I don't remember which day it was when we found out what happened and it was so graphic and gruesome, at least on like Twitter X, whatever you want to call it, like the video footage and just the details. And I'm like, for me personally, I'm like, I, I understand it's important to share the terrible murders and rape, like all the disgusting things going on um, that happened to to Israel and, and they were kidnapped. And like they're, the one thing that I want to do is like, OK, we, we know that we see that's going on. But I, I feel fragile, and I think so many of our listeners are fragile, and I just think society as a whole is fragile. So, what better way to fight all the nasty, disgusting things that happen than what's going on with just the positive of like showing how much love there is in the Jewish nation, which unfortunately comes out with disaster, um, and it's it's been working because I, I have two reasons that I know it's working. One is the data, which is less interesting to me, like. It's crazy. Just on YouTube alone, we have, as of now, over 100 million views just in the past two weeks, which is like a number I was telling you before I can't even fathom. But more importantly, the private messages that people sent of like, 
you don't understand what this is doing for me. Like I shut off, took off all the apps on my phone. I'm just like on your WhatsApp group and just seeing the news coming out. Or like someone saying how they broke down because they're like just in fear of what's going on. And, and unfortunately, there's like a rise of anti-Semitism. So like those messages, and I got a lot of those. And we got a lot of those, not just me, um, the whole team. And like that, I'm like, whoa, they're like there's a clear impact. And there's like a hole over here that we're filling with just positivity. Mm. I feel like I'm bragging a lot. I don't mean to be. And I, I it's unfortunate that I have so many things I have to, I want to say, but yeah. you gave me guidelines before. Yeah. I have, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, let's let's actually switch to the opposite of the side of the coin. Like it's it's interesting to watch your meteoric rise and like how much success you've had because I, as your friend, I know how much pressure you're under and how much work you're putting in. More importantly, like how crazy it is. Our mutual friend Benji Weintraub, we, he was talking about this in, in regards to Mayor K. Where I'm like, Benji, you're so talented. Like you do all these like interesting things. He's like a traveler, musician, and like he's just so off the grid. Like no one really knows who he is or anything. Um, not no one. I mean, a lot of people do. No, but... no, no one. No. <laughs> <laughs> but like he doesn't. He didn't build a brand or anything. Which we need to talk about that. But um, he's he looked at me and he's like, it's not worth it to me. Right. And we were on a trip with Mayor K. It was a random trip in Miami many years ago, and he got stopped. I kid you not, like 20 times in like the hotel areas of people want to take a picture. Oh, can you do a with Mayor or Benji? Me, Mayor and Benji. No, so, who want they want to take a picture with? Um, of me. No, I'm kidding. Of Mayor. Of they mayor. Wanted oh, no, mayor. I thought you meant of Benji. Right. No, they wanted to do, they wanted to, they wanted Mayor to do like a video. Oh, my class did a project based on your YouTube video. And he's like, and he always has to be like engaged and on. Right. And like Benji looks at me, he's like, this is what I'm talking about. Like, <laughs> he's like, I don't want any of this. And and um I I wonder like how you deal with the criticism and the pressure. I mean, I know some of it, but like yeah, it's funny. At least these two weeks, like I don't feel pressure. Was it you said it? Someone's like, "Wow, you have a big weight." Like a lot of people looking to see what you post. I don't feel pressure like that. I'm just like, okay, I'm trying to spread the positive, good things happening. Like we're not perfect, but there's no pressure there. It's just it, it but it is overwhelming. Of like, okay, there's just <laughs> there's so much good happening with all the bad, and it's like I want to get out as much as I can as quickly as I can. So I I feel very overwhelmed, and I but think, that's but that's you in general. You have yeah. a lot you want to get out, and as much. But as but it's can. never. It's funny. It's never pressure. Like I don't feel like you have the weight of a lot of people watching or listening. Like I don't look at it like that. Like I don't. I I tell everyone. Like I'm not. Even though like we're definitely a powerful force in like the space of media, we're not. We're not like of any form of das Torah or any like real decision making for like our goal is to like start conversations whether it's about finance and mental health or inspiration like there's to me there's no way yes obviously there's responsibility you have to be i have to be responsible and and bring on proper guests and proper co host and like things like that but but i don't feel pressure i just feel what do you what do you think of like the home. the tortured artists like do you think there's any truth to that that like all these artists you have to be like tortured i mean do you consider yourself an artist like do you not in that way i don't think so mm -hmm. i mean yes and no. i i see it more i think casey nice that says like i see it more of like a storyteller like i like telling stories like mm -hmm. i used to love doing snapchat stories or my whatsapp status and i'm doing that i think just on a bigger scale with others and the help of a lot of people but I, I see it more of like a storyteller than an artist, but maybe storytellers are artists. I don't know. How important is branding? What are some tips to like create a brand? Yeah, I think every single company listening to this or watching this will gain from this one note. They're not going to listen to it, but I think everyone will shift how they communicate with the world for the better. Every single company, every single person putting out any form of content has to know at the root of it that they're a storyteller. If they're saying, oh, I'll put this out so I can get more clients, wrong. I'll put this out so I'll make more money, wrong. That could be in the background of why you're doing certain things, but people have every reason to look away from your business, your company, your podcast, whatever you're putting out, and you have to give them a reason to look at it. So give them value. If you're a, a business that uh, wants people to buy their batteries, show the stories of how batteries, their batteries are saving someone's life, or if you're uh, you know, a doctor, you want to show a, you know, incredible, nice story that happened, or it doesn't have to only be stories, but you're, you have to communicate over a nice idea, whether it's educational or informational or any form of 
making someone feel value from seeing your content. And every single place, a company, like I have a small uh, marketing firm, every single one I start with and they're like, yeah, yeah, we hear that. But still, we need to, I'm like, well, you're thinking in terms of like three seconds. Think of this in five years. Like, where do you want to be in five years from now? And you will only grow your business and your, I didn't get into brand per se, but you'll only grow it if you actually give what people want. What is a brand? I don't know. I'm not like a marketing guru. I mean, although I'm wearing this fancy tie for this interview, so I clearly know what I'm talking about. A brand is 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 basically someone understanding your vibe without a lack of a better term. They understand your vibe, your mission, your essence, and they can kind of guess what your next move will be. Like this, I'll give you an example. Someone knows that on Inspiration for the Nation, they could kind of guess what kind of guest I'm getting. They're not perfect because I guess I'm in my head and I know what I'm looking for, but they understand the vibe. Like if like some, I used Brad Pitt before, but like we'll use him again. If Brad Pitt said, you know, he wants to be on it, they'll, I think they'll know like, no, no, Brad Pitt, why does he make sense for it? Like who actually understands understands us. I think that's what a brand is. I don't really like my description. No, that's about. that's actually interesting. I heard that like if um if Nike made a hotel, yeah. you could you could know what the hotel would look like. If Hyatt made a sneaker, you would have no idea. Because right. Nike has a much stronger brand. Yeah, yeah. That's a great example. Mm-hmm. That's totally what it is. The thing just going back to my show, so you gave me the name of Out of the Courtroom. Yeah. Your name Living Lachaim, like when you said it to me, I was like, man, this guy's good. Like, it's so funny because I got pushed back. I got pushed back from that and I got pushed back from Kosher Money. I had like the text, like with the people, I think it was Benji actually pushing back. I was like, I don't like it. I'm like, it's very easy to hate. It's very easy to love something once it's established and be like, oh, that's great. Like how I built this podcast. Great. I, it encompasses like exactly what it is and it's good. But I'm sure when they started it, they're like, there were people who loved it and some naysayers. I wonder how much of it is just your confidence in it. No, there's certain, I'll give you a good example. I know that Kosher Money is a better name for a podcast than Inspiration for the Nation. I love Inspiration for the Nation, but it's long, it's lengthy. For various reasons, I went with it. And it's funny, I came up with Kosher Money for my brother, he hosts Kosher Money, and my brother came up with Inspiration for the Nation for me. It it made sense, and I think it's the best name that I could have come up to with where I was up to. But it's a little lengthy. It doesn't exactly it, like describe what I'm doing. While kosher money is a very good broad understanding, and like you get it in a second. And I, I love out of the courtroom. Also, I think it's a little long, but it was perfect for what you did. But now it's it's different. I had an idea for your podcast. Tell me. I think it's cool if you like called it. You know, something that I wanted to do event, but I and I'm not going to end up doing it. But like. Call it like a thousand interviews or something like that. Not interviews, like a thousand humans. And you're sh- clearly shifting, but like shifted to be like, I'm trying to speak to people that in my life personally and that I know of that I find interesting or whatever words you want. Like it's cool because then, yeah, you have an end goal. When you get up to there, I mean, a thousand is a lot. Um, but you'll, you know, get to the end. Okay, then maybe it'll turn into 2000. But I think it's better than what's in now. Jason, Jason Ingber podcast. Yeah. Who cares about Jason Ingber besides you're like your mother? Does she listen? It's funny. I switched to because... your parents listen. No, really? <laughs> uh, I was gonna say hi to them, but okay, not hi to them. Um, my no, I I think like they'll they'll listen to like one or two of them. Do they listen to mine? They do. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> my mom. My mom has no time. My mom does not listen she to podcasts. She, 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 she yeah. I I like look at her phone and like her WhatsApp like gives me anxiety oh, from gosh. like thousands of Tehillim That's chats and everything else doesn't matter. Yeah. But my my friend, Daniel Schwartz, he gave me the idea to switch it to Jason Ingber podcast. He got it from Naval Ravikant, who I don't think, I think, I think I've sent him your way, but I don't think you I listened to one with. of his things. He's not my, he's not for me, but but I understand the value. He's a very life. arrogant person, so he can rub people the wrong way because he comes off as so authoritative. He's also very sophisticated. Like, he's too sophisticated for me. Like, ideas that he's giving over like it's very high level okay whatever maybe he uses, the one he uses fancy words to. maybe maybe but in any event he was saying to build equity in your own name and for me as an attorney it actually kind of makes sense because when people google jason ingber and they see me linked with like famous attorneys i'm gonna get bill barr on my show i had alan dershowitz on my show like i've had big names especially in the local la attorney scene like i've had big trial attorneys so if you search my name and you want like a lawyer 
then you see, oh my gosh, he's also having conversations with these guys. These guys love this. But guy. I feel like you're making that mistake of trying to not, we'll use the example of like make money through your podcast. So you're like, oh, you're trying to gain rec, like just being recognized. And like, that's not the core of it. Your audience, like, what do they care about that? Like your I'm, core should I'm be like, I want to put out good episodes for my audience. And hmm, what's going to get the most people to listen? I don't think Jason Ingber show. Yes, there may be a benefit for your law firm through that for sure. But in growth and like getting 100,000 people to be listening, I don't think you're going to even ever be possible to get. So it's not Ingber about show. content. It's about even if Brad Pitt, if you keep bringing him up, want to do a show, I would suggest to him, don't call it the Brad Pitt show. You'll come up with better names than that. Like even Donald Trump, Barack Obama, I'm president, like don't call, and people do that. And I think it's a mistake. I think they shouldn't be calling the show just straight, at least podcast straight after the name. Mm -hmm. But I think also there's a certain element that like, I need to be totally passionate about it in order to keep doing it. You could, but you don't need to do that with the name. I guess I'm talking more about, not I guess, I'm specifically talking more about having more diverse people than just lawyers. Like I would get burnt out. That's fine, but then shift the name of your show and shift the mission. You're, you're not doing that. I mean, mm -hmm. you didn't do that clearly. Jason Ingram show, like mm -hmm. it's still very powerful. Like I don't understand what this is. Even mm -hmm. your dedicated listeners, like they're they're deaf, uh, not probably because I spoke to them. They're confused. Like what is going on over here? Mm -hmm. Again, sure? this probably too meta for people. I, I don't know if they find this interesting. It is interesting because it's the nuts and bolts of marketing mm -hmm. and it's your mind about it. And I think I that's really so. cool. What, what are your, what are some of your favorite moments from your own show or behind the scenes moments of getting a guest? You finally get a guest like you had Ben Shapiro on. I know a little bit about the work that you put into getting that. Yeah, I think at least with getting guests, there's a book my brother gave me called The Third Door. And it basically is this guy interviewed the 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 top people I, I, like Bill Gates, et cetera, like queens like the top people that are hardest to get to he random guy interviewed them and this is like even before i guess interviews and podcasts like became like the third web like easy access to control your own stories and stuff like that he did that before and his analogy is if you're trying to get into a club there's always three doors there's the main door where everyone waits on and like you have to wait a long time to even get in and maybe you won't even get in then there's a VIP, like if you're born into success or you have enough money or you're with the right people, you could get in. And he's like, there's always a back door like to the club like that no one's looking at. And it's very hard to get to. But once you get in, you get in. So I have that approach with any guests. I mean, we had Ben Shapiro, Dave Ramsey um, and 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 so many others and, and either people that I, I think and you actually help with this, like the Horowitzes, where he has ALS which I consider doing that episode one of the getting them to agree to say yes as, as more her and things to you and uh, the Freedmans and and everyone who helped and, and them for agreeing to do it. But like they like we use a third door with them, like we pushed. I used every angle and and of course, I didn't want to do it in an insensitive way, but I was very passionate to say like there's I don't know of another podcast interviewing someone with ALS. And maybe it exists. I didn't know of it. And I researched that. did not find it. But to me, like, that is, give me any president of the United States, I'll interview them. But, like, to me, this is, like, the next level. But, like, I have that mindset of there's always a third door. You have to be respectful and, and kind and nice and, and not manipulative in any way. But if you're passionate and natural, you could really, I, at least with interviews, interview anyone. And in terms of favorite moment, I've been saying a certain favorite moment on like any, not any time, but like the three times I've been interviewed. So I don't want to say that moment again. Um, I don't know. I hate, I hate this question because it's cliche, but like, it's like asking someone who's their favorite child and like have hundreds of children, I guess in this case, just like that guy you interviewed, um, which he clearly has a favorite. I interviewed one. him here. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, branding mistake on my end. Um, okay. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. He actually just crossed like 5,000 oh views. Like people love it. They comment gosh. all the time. Yeah, let's not bring that up. Um, trying to think. I don't know. It, it's hard. It's hard to say. It's really hard to say. Mm -hmm. Different times, different moments. Someone just reached out this morning. They said the Libby Weiss interview. I interviewed this girl that um, sadly her father just passed away. And um, not too be long before that, she she had a stroke. 
I mean, she's doing a lot better than she was, but she was someone that like, I heard it in her voice, like how challenging her life has been. And like hearing her story, I don't, there's really that I'm like kept up, like thinking about it, but like that kept me up at night. And like her just resilience was very inspirational for me. So just that as a whole would be nice. She's great. Wow. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah, I think you sent it to me. My parents listened to that one. Both of my parents. Oh, really? My mom found time for that one That's too. <laughs> yeah. No, that was, well, we that knew was we knew we knew the dad. I like I right. hung He's out with a, him yeah. many times. Yeah. Yeah, great guy. I knew him very well. Um, yeah, wow. So you have so much intentionality and you struck gold on Twitter X when you got the owner of Twitter X to did he retweet you or just like your tweet? He did both. He retweeted you? He retweeted one of the things. That's insane. And then he, no, I don't think he retweeted anything. Sorry. He didn't retweet anything. But he commented. Like he, he commented on one and he liked another. No, he. I think he retweeted actually. Actually, I don't remember. I, I don't even know. There's one. One was. But it was like heavy engagement in one day from engaged, Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah. On and, it about, and it was uh, I'm so happy that it was about the Holocaust and him talking about going um, to Auschwitz to see it and, and to the reason of him basically going is because I was impressed that he originally said no when a rabbi asked him like live um, to everyone and he said no like I, I listen I think it's terrible what happened but I've seen enough to emotionally feel and the rabbi basically countered with it's still important because if people see Elon Musk going then that's that could make a kiddush Hashem that's not the word he used and I don't even know what that is and he thought about it and like a few minutes later on that live conversation he's like you know what I'm going to, I'm tentatively going to go because of that, because like of the impact that can make. So I retweeted that conversation, basically. I tweeted that out or posted it and he commented on it. So that was the biggest. And there's another thing he said about nothing in this world will give you more happiness than, than your children. That I think he, he reposted or liked that, that um, which didn't get as much buzz as the other thing. I think commenting was, was a lot more powerful. Um, but that also, I'm like, wow, that's it's so nice hearing it. Did you gain a bunch of followers because of that? I don't think so. I mean, I, I definitely did. <laughs> you got but, like a lot of impressions probably. Yeah, yeah. The most like, yeah, crazy impressions. And and for me, it was like clout, like one of probably the most influential person in the world, like responding to me, yes, on his platform, but like, I was shaking when when it happened. Like, whoa! Like, this is because I was trying to get his attention, and maybe one day I'll interview him. Maybe there's a third door over there. But this is it. This is like the beginning of it. Like, for I'm, kosher money, for for yeah. I'm, I happen to think he, he would be perfect for inspiration for the nation. Also, mm-hmm. I think he's very inspirational. Someone like him, like you would think. Have you had non-Jewish guests on your? Yeah, I had the hearts. They're 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 trying to convert, or they're in the process. They are not Jewish. That um, doesn't count. They're like halfway, <laughs> the, but they're literally not Jewish. Um, on inspir- we had Dave Ramsey. He's like he's a hardcore Christian in the slightest. I mean, he's a big fan of the Jews, and mm-hmm. we're a big fan of his. But he is not Jewish. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, there's been a few on that's an issue and kosher money. I'm trying to think of inspiration nation. If there's another, I think there's another one or two. I mean, I'm going after a few um, non-Jews, um, but. You know, we'll get there eventually. Like, you don't have, I don't think you, I think it's a mistake that you will make. Like, you don't have to be Jewish in order to be an inspiration for the nation. Like, my goal is to show that every person has a mission in life and how they tap into it. So it's very diverse. You'll find someone that you'll love a certain episode and you'll hear another person like, that really doesn't speak to me. And someone else will be like, oh, that person actually speaks to me and that person doesn't. Like, my, my goal is to be super diverse. So you don't have to be Jewish in order to have a mission. Mm -hmm. Would he be your dream guest? Yeah. I know you have your, you have a hard out soon. You're working on getting Mark Cuban and you have a call with his team. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I'm working very hard on that. Um, That's a joke. I would love Mark Cuban also. Um, Yeah. I would, I would say that to me. It's not such a joke. We had a talk conversation about it. Yeah. No, but uh, Elon would be, yeah, definitely. Like I do think he's in the sphere where it's like kind of out of reach, but you know, I'm not actively going after him, but yeah, it'd be, it'd be an honor to have him. And I think um, I think I, I can make a Kiddush Hashem with that conversation. Mm-hmm. What would be three words you'd use to describe your brand? Happy. Jewish. Inspirational. I think for all, although Inspiration for the Nation is the, is the podcast that I host, 
I do think every show that we put out, we're trying to inspire someone to do something. So if it's that's an issue, it's like we're trying to inspire them to take on mental health as less taboo or to get the help they need or just to understand how much challenge how many challenges people have or kosher money if it's like if it it's it's literally for people that are struggling with finances which is a lot of jewish people because the cost of living as a jew is a lot we want to inspire people to to take a hold of of their their life and they could do something better or if they have a lot of money and there's that comes with a lot of challenges also um to to use use whatever tools they have to fight and win and live mm -hmm. a happier life one thing that's also interesting as i'm getting a little bit deeper into the youtube analytics myself like i have a little bit more data i was sitting in dc at a restaurant with turks and i was like trying to i i don't know remember exactly how it came up but i said i'll split i'll split the profits of my video what i do with you and then like i didn't realize how laughable that was you know what i mean like I think I think it made like as of this conversation, I think it made a dollar. Uh, did he I mean? did he laugh? Did he like he 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 dug into me pretty pretty harshly because he has I guess some familiarity from like Twitter and other other areas of the of the um, zeitgeist. But the analytics for you, it's it's interesting. Like also when I was crossing the threshold of monetization, in order to do that, it was either four thousand watched hours and in in long form or 10 million hits in YouTube shorts, 10 million hits in order to be eligible to wow. get a cent from them. And they're monetizing before you. They, they put right. ads, they slap they do ads, ads no matter what. They're doing ads no matter what. So YouTube has to eat, but it takes so much time. Like, I'm curious if you can opine on what the analytics are and how, how you, what you've learned from all that back end. Yeah, I mean, I could pull it up, but I was just checking. We have over, I think it's like 100, and one or 103 million views um, on YouTube now, obviously very war related stuff. I think we made from that a little over $3,000 from the 100 million. It's short form. So obviously the longer something is, the more money you'll make. Um, but just, it's like, it's, it's bonkers. Like the amount of effort that not just me, like five people are putting in in order to obviously, our goal isn't to make money with it, but it's like, okay, once we're doing it, great, let's make some money. But like $3,000 is a lot of money. But for the amount of views that's going in, like YouTube is making a lot more money. Um, and people ask all the time, like sometimes like very not their place to be asking it. Like if I know you and we're talking a bit like I hear like random people would text me like, by the way, how much money does Living Lafayette make from YouTube? Like that's not like, I'm like, how much money salary do you make a year? Like first answer that question, which I don't do obviously. And I'm like, I'm, I'm nice to them, but like just, Speaking in general, like that's a little off to ask, but um, it, it's like I don't even have a clear answer. Like our kosher money episodes will make more money because YouTube awards rewards more money based content because I guess more people are searching for it. So one show will make more money than others. And then, yeah, it's it's pretty random. I mean, for the amount of work going in, I don't think it's significant, but it's at the point where it's definitely part of. Living with Chaim as a whole, we are an organization and it is one of the three rungs in terms of making the, I guess, the business of Living with Chaim run. Like we take that money, we pay our editors, we pay um, this, you know, the grad, whatever it is that we need in order to keep the shows going and growing. But for YouTube also, shorter is better. What advice would you have then for a young aspiring YouTuber that's like just getting in the game? I guess... The funny thing about that question is I'm literally that guy and I know the advice you're going to give me because you've been like slamming me. With I'm it. so tired of giving you that advice uh -huh. and you're not listening. No, but let's say just someone that wants it to just get in. Well, the first game. of all, aside from aside from you want me to just be more focused and more intentionality behind hitting a specific thing over and over and over and over again. The, the thing about that is, let's say, like to take an extreme example, there's like a guy on TikTok that his whole thing is like, um, he dances, he wears the Joker face paint, and he dances to a specific song in public places. Or there's like a guy that does like Jordan Peterson impressions. And I just feel bad for these guys because they have to keep doing that one thing. And like, they seem like they're having a great time. They could pivot, they could pivot. They Can could. They? Yeah, yeah, yeah. They slowly introduce different different people that they, they could do impressions of. They didn't get the memo because these yeah, guys- Yeah, no, some people don't get the memo and they and they just do their one thing. And some people are- one hit wonders they're only capable of doing one thing they try with other stuff but 
I think the root of it is you, if like you want to do YouTube or podcasts or whatever it is to make money, you're going to fail. Like that is not the root of it. You have to be whatever your channel or podcast is about. You have to be passionate about it. So if you are, then you'll be able to produce whatever it is. Even if you get two views or very low amount of views, you'll be satisfied because you're like, I'm providing what I think the world needs. So if you have that, you there, nothing will get in the way. I have yet to find, and I get a lot of calls, people like, oh, I have an idea for a podcast, whether they want to like do it on Living the Climb or they want to do it on them by themselves. Um, and I, and I, at this point, I like kind of stop like taking those kind of calls. Um, at first, I'm like, oh, let me help out. And I came to the point, thank God, where it's like too many calls. But more than that, I have not found one person who did it and actually went past like five episodes of putting out anything. And I'm like, no offense, you're wasting my time. I gave you an hour of my time. And it's like, I told them, I said, you have to be doing this because you really want to be doing this because you believe in what you're doing. And none of them did it. And, and I wish there was at least one of them. Um, and there are great other podcasts out there and people that are doing it. But I think the root is that they believe in what they're doing. And even if they don't get any lessons, yes, obviously getting, making that impact is helpful and, and, and is needed in order to like keep on going and keep that energy up. But you at the root of it are going to be the deciding factor whether you will be successful or not. See, that's what's interesting about moi because I'm starting to push the boundaries of that advice where like people say, just like keep going, get over the like I've put out well over 100 now. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot. You but you understand that. That's a lot. Now, yeah. some, some the truth is, though, I took like a four month break once. So that's kind of like starting again. Not necessarily. Not necessarily, but obviously, it, it but it, it, it slows down a ton of momentum. So I, I'm not, I'm not saying I've been doing like once a week, which is what you've been saying. It needs to be like, I told you, I told you two, you personally, I said two things. I said, first of all, like figure out your brand because you totally are shifting too often and then sick and that will dictate which kind of uh, guests and, and audience that I guess you're speaking to. And secondly, be consistent. Like you have not been doing either of them. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm going to my goal, my goal before I go back to L.A., we're in your uh, wonderful office here in New York. My goal before I go back to L.A. is to set up that because I have like 20 episodes that I have edited and from from Bumdog is his name um, and set them on a publishing schedule because I saw you doing that. I was like, this guy's genius. Like on a Friday, you're like teeing everything up so that on yeah. Saturday night it just goes off. You do you set it like Matzo Chavez or Beno Tom that like it goes off like. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're talking about Inspiration for the Nation. We release it on Saturday night. Um, but yeah, everything, it's a good, it's a good force for me to like, I has to be ready before Shabbos because I'm not interested in Matsi Shabbos when, when Shabbos ends, just going and loading and everything. Like I still have to do marketing for it, but everything is set before. Like, like next week we're putting out kosher money. It's basically finished, it's ready to go. Um, obviously there's certain times where things have to be done last minute. But overall, 95% of the time, everything has to be ready to go automated. Like, like I'm, we're pretty much finished with 2024 of that's an issue, not recording, but in terms of like strategy of like what we want to do, like that's, it's finished already. Cause if it wasn't like we're working on, thank God, six shows, which one of the shows you're basically producing and making, which I don't want to tease it yet, but but it needs to be done in advance. And even though we're finished the first episode, I'm pushing for saying, don't release it until we have an episode two and three, because I know that that grind and that that time sensitivity of putting out the next thing, we need to be ahead of the curve. Mm. And I think it's important. And it's hard to do. I think a lot of like I have a muscle for it. Like I've been doing this for over three years now, but it's it's a hard muscle to, to, to get to be advanced. You have certain you, you have certain questions that are standard. Yeah. What's your favorite mitzvah? Yeah. That question drives me crazy. It, it is not a question that I am happy about. <laughs> I think my brother-in-law, Arm Brody, Dr. Arm Brody, I'll go to him in TNAC if you need a dentist, he's great. Um, he came up with it. He came up with a few of those questions, not all of them. Uh, and I, I, I think it's just a good representation of like the core of what someone aspires to do or be. Like that's really the core of like why I asked that question. So so it's I, a hard question to answer, but I give them I didn't, all I in didn't, advance. I didn't. I didn't um I didn't want you to elaborate on that but yeah. um but I, I hear that and I think that that's really cool that you have it like streamlined. I need to so let's say I would take your advice and let's say I would only do law. 
but that's the thing, right? It, it goes back to what you were saying before. Like, you need to be passionate to do it. If I'm only doing law, I'm not going to be passionate by this. You also, I'm fascinated by the fact that you're still pulling Jewish people that are inspiring or people that fit your show and fit the mold of your program. Because it's like, how many times can you hear different criminal attorneys? Also, another thing that I recognize after interviewing several attorneys is that a lot of them, they come off as really dynamic. But then when you start interviewing them, they're like, I can't get into specifics about X, Y, Z and ABC. And you're like, oh my gosh, well, those are the really what I came to talk to you about. So lawyers can be a tricky group. They can be pretty feisty. I totally agree. There's a lot of challenges, especially with that group. But I, I also know that there's and, and there's not, a market for it. Yourself. Yeah. If you're not passionate about it, you're not passionate that it can never change. But there is in five years from now going to be multiple law podcasts. And there's a bunch of them and I, because I, I, I do a lot of work with Morgan Morgan. Like I am in the know, but I think a lot of them are just totally missing the boat and they're just trying to sell and they're not doing a good job. Okay, so there so will I'll, be, there will I'll, be I the can... Joe Rogan laws of the world, but you don't want to be one of them. No, I could do that. No, could... the, you don't. You, clearly, the only way you could do it is you find a way that you could be passionate about it. I think if I could streamline it and, and make it like a template and something that I'm comfortable with. No, nah, you won't stick to it. Right. Right. Describing it. right. Totally not. You're right. I don't know why I'm trying to shoehorn this. And we've had so many um, pivots back to the, um, to the, to whatever. Um, what would be a good way to end podcasts like for me? Let's say you see where I'm taking my show. I, I like to I'm... end it with at least inspiration for the nation. I like to end it with with something inspiring because I, I think that's the, the root of why people are listening. So that's for me personally. For your show, I don't know what your show is about. So I don't know how to end it. Well, my show is about interesting people. You know. And. Um, I don't. I, I think also not. The premise is like, like I interviewed a homeless guy, I interviewed like an exotic dancer, this guy that has over 150 kids, like unique people. I'm interested in shifting power dynamics, like taking power and redistributing it through conversation. And I'm doing that. And it's interesting. And getting interesting people, people that are good talkers, that never gets old. Like I, I hear that, but brand, brand your show more like what how you just so described what it. would be a good like let's say let's say it's let's say it's, it's okay well we'll talk about that off air like i feel like we're just dragging on with that sort of thing no, your but, show could be called unique humans the it's u and h but like you you unique humans or you could put the number thing in there 613 unique humans i don't know just 613 but whatever it's like a random number like that. 999 999 unique humans why the number unique humans is pretty good unique humans i don't know if it's not taken go for it um it just, yeah, but you want to be fit. Yeah, to figure out a way to end the podcast. Like a friend of mine was like, you need a game or some sort of like thing. Oh. I guess we can end on a, we can, I could, I could steal from you and just ask you like the most inspirational moment from your show. But we, we already kind of covered that. Kind of covered but, or that. just. You're asking it for me personally or in on what's this something episode recently or in that, general, what you should do on the end of your episodes. In general and for, and to wind down this one, like what, what, what would be. Not for this one, but I think maybe you could ask them like, Who's the, who's the coolest person you've ever met or, or like you look up to and why? That could be cool. It's maybe too inspirationally, um, but unique. Like what, what, what makes... What's you the most unique human you met? Right, something like that. Um, Damn, you're good. Maybe I'll end with this. I think a lot of people watching, um, wh whoever's watching, I do think they're going to see this. If they don't know me personally, they're going to be like a little surprised. <laughs> because I'm serious because like I am so in when I'm in your seat and like the host, like I try as much as possible not to be myself, not not be myself, not to not make it about you. Yeah, it's not about me. Like I'm trying to talk as little as possible. I'm trying to like just feed off their energy. And like right now I'm the guest, which it's, it's honestly harder for me to do because I'm just so used to being a host at this point. So like I am being a little more I'm not negative, but I'm being a little more negative like not negative, but like I'm kibitzing a little more. Like I'm, you know what I mean? Like giving you a hard time again because I know you well. But I feel like they'll be a little surprised at that, which is fine. I, I think it's like no, like where you, like which cap you wear. Like if you are in life, the oh gosh, hate the cap. Oh man, why did I make it? Like, if you are the host of a show, be the host of a show. If you're the guest of the show, be the guest of the show. If you're a father, be a father. If you're a child, be a child. If you're a spat, like know your role. And, and I think through life, we're wearing multiple hats again not trying to point to your hat but like in each 
situation know which role that you're supposed to do. And so this this guy I just yeah. interviewed on my podcast, Mark Brenner, he's a renowned child psychologist, but more in the dynamic of parenting. Mm -hmm. He posed one question that changed a lot of how I approach things of just remember to ask yourself whenever you're in a dynamic, like, how do you want to come across? Mm. It took me 50 episodes of my own podcast to be like, I'm not trying to be Howard Stern. Like, I'm not trying to just be like right. bombastic and make it about me. Like, it's a different animal. Yeah. And it, and you, you're very good at not making it about you. You're very good and at My this. brother, Ellie, always tells me constantly. He doesn't listen, but the few times he listens. And I think I've gotten better. He's like, shut up. Stop talking. Because you, you do want to. Right. He tells me be more concise. You do want to like make. He's very do, kind. Shout out to Ellie. Langer. You want to make like the. Like me and you, we love jokes and we like making jokes. Like you, like you have that perfect joke, and it's like you have to hold back a lot of times, and it's hard. But ultimately, it's it's the better move in this role to make it about the guest, not about you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. How do you end these things? So at the time of the conversation that we had, Yaakov had five hundred thousand subscribers. Yet now he has over a million. How did he catapult himself that far that fast? And he quoted Casey Neistat. I asked him about it after. We had the conversation before I published this video. And he said that the first 100,000 subscribers is always the hardest. But after that, once you develop a consistent formula and you build into it, like anything in life that you're building, you can get compound interest. So watching him work in public, developing the blueprint that he talked about, anyone can do it. Super inspiring for me. He really is an inspiration for the nation. Thank you for tuning in and enjoying this channel. Please like and subscribe and share this podcast. Comment below. Thank you again. You said thank you twice. Did I say thank you three times or just thank you again? Thank you, thank you again. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Uh, Fine, we'll keep it. All right. Thank you and thank you again. <laughs> Okay, you know what? I'm going to keep in this part of you making fun of me for being so thankful. Okay, we'll see how you feel about that. So like you just heard, at the time we recorded this conversation, Yako had 500,000 subscribers, and now he has over a million. Well, how did he get that far, that fast? Some of it was because he's been posting war content, and he's a whore. But I'm not going to talk about that. Milking the grief of orphans.